Hello, and I've been busy for the last couple of weeks with the OLC Code Jam 2020, but I thought I would find the time to squeeze in a quick video. And this video is about a rather niche data structure called an integral image. Conventionally, there aren't a lot of uses for integral images, but when the circumstances are just right, it's a very powerful structure indeed, and can significantly reduce the computational complexity of various spatial algorithms. Now, this is a coding quickie video, so we'll be going through things at some pace. And just because it's been the focus of my week, if you stick around to the end, there's a little demonstration of my submission to the Code Jam. So let's get started. Fundamentally, integral images, or sometimes called summed area tables, are a way of calculating the sum of a subregion within a space. Here I have a 2D space split up into a grid. It's a 2D array. And for example, we could set some of the cells in this grid to be uh, on. So let's set these ones. Shade them in means that these cells are active, two together there. In total, I've shaded in seven cells. And so assuming that my cells can only have the values zero or one, if I were to sum this entire region, the result would be 7. And calculating the sum of this region is as trivial as it sounds. We would start in the top, and we would just iterate through all of the cells, counting whenever we hit a cell that's equal to 1. And if we were interested in some subregion, we would define where that subregion starts, and we would do the same thing. We'd start here, and we'd iterate through all of the cells in that region, and count how many are set to 1. In a small example such as this, that might not seem like much of a problem, but let's say our grid was very large indeed. Suddenly, counting through cells individually is quite a time-consuming task. And even worse, the time that it takes depends on the size of the subregion you're trying to find the sum of. If, however, we first generated an integral image, we could calculate the sum of a region with just four additions, and it doesn't matter how large that region is. One of the drawbacks to using an integral image is that that computational cost exists when we create the integral image in the first place. So they are useful for data sets such as this that don't change very often. For example, our space here could represent a tile map in a game, and the tiles that are shaded are the solid platforms. We might want to do some sort of collision check against them, i.e. fundamentally they don't change. Thus we can create the integral image map, potentially even offline, but we only need to create it once for this spatial representation. So how do we create this map? The principle is very simple. For any given cell, we give it a value which represents the sum of all of the cells to the left and above it. So we know that we've got seven cells in this entire space. So in the bottom right hand corner here, I know that the value of this cell is seven. It represents the sum of all the set cells in the entire space. Knowing this, I'm going to start hand calculating this algorithm from this location, because we know for in this cell, the entire number of set cells in this region is equal to one. If I move on, to the next cell along, the sum is still 1. If I move to the next cell along, we can see we've now got another set cell. So our sum becomes 2. The next cell, the sum is 2. The next cell, 3, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, all the way to the end. So we now know how to sort of look at this map and generate this information. So let's go ahead and start filling in some of these sums. At this point, we're looking at this region. And we can see we've got one set cell already. In this region, we can see that there are three set cells. Now, as humans, we can see that, but how can we computationally derive it? Well, we know that the cell above our current location represented this entire region, and it had a value of 2. We know that the cell we've just computed represented this entire region, and the sum was 1. We know that the cell we're currently investigating is going to increase our count by 1. But as part of our summation, we've included this region twice. And so we need to subtract it once. And we know that the sum of that region was equal to 1. And if we add up the region above us to the region to the left of us, and the current cell, but subtract the region to the top left of us, we get the number of set cells up to the point we're testing. In this case, it's 3. So we can write 3 
into our cell. What's interesting about that approach is it hasn't required us to compute anything in the future and it's only relying on the cells we've already computed. So given that we started from the top left, we can scan through our source image and develop this integral image. So let's continue. I'll do this cell manually again, just to double check. Let's start with the current value of the cell, 1. And to that, we're going to add all of the region above it. We'll then add the sum of the region to the left of it. But we've included the region to the top left of our current location twice. So we'll subtract the sum of that region. 1 plus 3 plus 4 minus 3 is, of course, 5. And we can see we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 set cells in the region from the top left to our current location. And no surprises, when we get to the bottom left cell, we could have calculated it, but we predicted it at the beginning. It's just going to be the entire number of set cells within the space. We have generated the integral image. In this instance, I've just simply used my cells as being ones or zeros, but they needn't be. You could use any numeric value for that cell. As long as you follow the same algorithm, the summation will take into account the cell values. Visually, it's convenient for me to represent these cells as booleans, because we can see seven set cells, and the total sum of our entire integral image is seven. But I'll show later a rather crude use case where the cells are not necessarily binary. Now, so what, I hear you ask? Well, let's assume we wanted to find the sum now of a region within our space. I've highlighted that region yellow. We can visually see that the result should be four. There are four set tiles. But using just four reads from our integral image, I can extract all of the information I need to give me the sum of the highlighted area. I know where the region is defined. It has a rectangle with an offset up here, and a size down here. If I read this cell, then I know the sum of all of this region. Rather boringly, it's zero. I'll get my next read from the cell in the bottom right of our region. That gives me the sum of this whole region, which is seven. This whole region includes information I'm not interested in. For example, I don't care about the sum of the cells here, and I can get that value by interrogating this location. We know that the sum there is 2, nor do I care about the region above me. And I can get that by interrogating this cell here, which has a value of 1. And when I perform this very simple calculation, the result is 4, which is the number of set cells in the region I am interested in. This is useful because for any region of the space, I can very quickly tell you does a cell exist or not without needing to search through all of the cells manually. I can perform four additions, and if the sum isn't zero, then I know a cell must exist in that region. And this is extremely useful for broad phase elimination when searching spaces for objects that you might want to interact with. And it allows us to construct rapidly various spatial partitioning structures, such as a quad tree. And I, I have promised before, but I will do a video specifically about quad trees. The integral image tells us that something exists, but it doesn't tell us where it exists. So I could superimpose a quad tree quite quickly and decompose it into the various layers, just using the area sums, i.e. I don't need to search in the space to yield whether or not I should break the quad tree down further. And I apologize if you don't know about quad trees, all of this may seem quite alien. But essentially it's a two-dimensional binary search. Given a quad, we can check a quad that's half the size. Does it contain a cell? Well, we know it contains a cell because we can do an earlier sum of our integral image. If it does contain a cell, then we'll break it down even further into its four quads. Does this one contain a cell? No, it doesn't. Does this one contain one? No, it doesn't. Does this one? No, it doesn't. And we'll have dismissed those very quickly using the area summation. This final one does, however, contain a cell, so we want to subdivide it further. And we can keep subdividing until we yield the locations of the cells. The take-home message is what we have avoided is iterating through all of the cells manually each time we want to generate some sort of spatial structure around them. 
But as I mentioned before, this technique is not very useful if your space is susceptible to change in any way, because you would have to regenerate the entire integral image each time. Let's have a look at coding this up into a quick demonstration. And as usual, I'm using the Pixel Game Engine to do so. It's a small one, 256 by 240, where each pixel is 4x4 four four screen pixels. And because this is a coding quickie, I'm going to pull in the code and describe it rather than do things line by line. I'm also going to flex my modern C++ muscles just a little bit. The first thing I'm adding is a template class called Image. And this is effectively a glorified two-dimensional array, that is all. But the fundamental data type of the array is specified by the template, so it could be floats, ints, whatever objects that we want. It has a create function where you specify the size of the image and it'll go and allocate the memory required for you. It overrides the assignment operator, copying the contents of this image into the target image. It has a get and a set function to access a specific pixel within the image or a cell within our 2D array and set its value or read its value accordingly. Fundamentally, all of the image data is stored as a unique pointer. And so in total, this simple image struct will memory manage itself and provides a robust way to work with 2D arrays. For this example, fundamentally the image in the background is going to be image tile boolean and its type int. This reflects the demonstration I've just shown in the slides. And in onuser create, I'm going to create that image to be 32 by 32 pixels. I want to visualize this image and each cell within the array is going to be drawn as an 8x8 pixel square. And I'll just iterate through every cell in the y and x axes and draw its contents depending on its value. I need a way to set and unset the cell content. So I'm going to grab the mouse coordinate in screen space but convert it to our image space by doing an integer divide by the size we specified earlier. If the user holds down the left mouse button then I'm going to set that particular location within the image to 1. If they're holding down the shift key at the same time, it's going to set it to 0, so we can erase the tiles. Let's just take a quick look to see if this works. Here's our empty image, and I can draw around with the mouse. And if I hold down the shift key, I can undo some of the cells. Very nice. I want the user to be able to draw a region within the image, and it's within this region we're going to count how many cells in the image have been set. So I'll add two integer vector types to define the start of the region, which will be the top left, and the region size. And I'll use the right mouse button to draw that region. When they press the button to begin with, we set the top left, and whilst it's held down, we're constantly setting the size of the region. We'll now draw the selection region on top of our image. Let's take a look. So with the right mouse button I can drag a rectangle around. And I can specify cells and I can change the region. It only works from top left to bottom right. I wouldn't draw regions in the opposite direction. We're not doing any error checking here today. So now we need to implement our integral image. Our integral image is fundamentally a 2D array of pixels. So we've already got a structure which defines this for us. So I'm going to make integral image a subtype of image. Again, it's a template because we could be using floating point values, we could be using integers or whatever. I'm going to add a function called calculate to the integral image, which will take in a reference to a normal image and generate a new image, which is the integral image. We know that the dimensions of the integral image will be the same size as the source image. And now I want to perform the integral image algorithm. So we're going to iterate through all of the cells going from top left to bottom right. And for each cell we're going to perform the region calculations that I showed before. We take the current value of the cell to which we'll add the sum of the entire region to the left of the cell. Then we'll add the sum of the entire region above the cell. But because the region to the top left of the cell has been included twice, we must remove it. And that's that. It's a very nice scanline algorithm. To this integral image structure, I'm also going to add a sum function, which takes in a region specified as a top left and a size, and performs the regional sums. We take our top left and our top right, our bottom left and bottom right. Now these are values extracted from the integral image now, 
and with just four additions, in this case I'm considering subtractions to be the same as additions, we've calculated the regional sum for the region that we've specified, without needing to iterate through all of the cells. To the demonstration, I'm going to add our new integral image type. Now, this will seem a little strange, and it's just for the purposes of demonstration, but each frame I'm going to recalculate my integral image. This kind of defeats the point, because I would have to scan through the entire source image just to generate this image. But since we're changing the source image and we're trying to just prove that this technique works, I'm okay with it. But I would encourage you to really only use this technique if you know that your source image doesn't change very often. Once I've drawn everything to the screen, I can then count how many set tiles are in the region by calling the sum function of our integral image over the region we've specified with the mouse cursor. And I'll display this result to the user. So let's take a look. So currently we've got no region defined, but I'm going to draw a handful of cells. With the right mouse button, I can drag my region around and we can see it counts the number of cells in that region. But it's counting them not by iterating through all of the cells, but just performing a very simple arithmetic calculation. If our source image was very high resolution, truly huge, it costs no more time to calculate those summations. This means it's a data structure for more forward-thinking applications. It's very trivial to actually implement, and in the right circumstances can save us a lot of processing overhead. However, the need to scan through the entire source image pixel by pixel in the first place does mean if the source image changes frequently, it's probably not a suitable approach. However, there are scenarios where it's ideal. Now, a million years ago, I used to work in the machine learning and computer vision industry. And in fact, this is where I was introduced to integral images for the first time. I was tasked with implementing an object tracking algorithm on some extremely limited hardware. The hardware didn't even have a multiplier. And the objective was to capture images in real time from a camera and follow an object of interest. There are many ways to perform high quality object tracking. And certainly integral images isn't one of them. However, it is useful enough in the right circumstances. And again, sort of implies it's a little bit niche. And so I thought I'd have a go at recreating that application. But I will say this before I get started with it. This is not a good way to do object tracking. Object tracking fundamentally should be involving image convolution, which we've talked about in my uh, 8 bits of image processing you should know video. And if you're really smart about it, you should be doing image convolution in the Fourier domain of the images too. However, this is a bit of a hack, but it was completely sufficient for my application at the time on the hardware I had access to. And like I say, it didn't even have a multiplier. That's how primitive this processor was. I'm going to add to this source file a second class. And this second class is going to make use of my webcam. Now, we've done several videos that feature webcams, and I always default to this Escapy library. I just like it. It's quick and simple. And even though there's a bit more code here than before, it's really nothing complicated. I've got some structures and information to set up the web camera. And in on user create, most of that is just setting up the web camera. I do, however, create an image which is going to display what the camera can see. And I create a smaller image which is going to represent what the object is that we're trying to track. In on user update, this code simply captures the image from the webcam and then sets the corresponding pixel in our image to the green channel value of the captured image. So most image processing only occurs in black and white. I then go and draw to the screen the full color image. It's more visually pleasing. I've put in here a little bit of temporal filtering just to reduce some of the noise from the webcam. And again, that's covered in my image processing video. But there's this comment here, which is the most interesting point. As I'm reading the image from the camera, pixel by pixel, I'm reading it from top left to bottom right. It's at this point I should also be recreating my integral image, because I can effectively do it for free. I've already got a loop iterating through the array in the right order. I'm only going to be using information I've already previously calculated, it is the perfect opportunity to not only capture the image in its raw form, but also generate the integral image at the same time. 
However, because I've got an integral image structure already good to go, I'm just going to call the calculate function here. This kind of defeats the point of using it in the first place, but it makes for a nice demonstration. Here I have a frame taken from the camera, and within that frame I've got an object that I wish to track. The object is most likely moving. To track the object, I'm going to cut it out of the frame, and then in the next frame search for a region which is similar. And I'm going to compare similarity by just looking at the regional sums. And this is incredibly crude. Ideally, I would want to convolve the entire camera image with this kernel, which is described by my subregion. And that would involve performing a multiply accumulate for every single pixel in the subregion with the corresponding pixel in the frame, but then doing that for all pixels. So there's a tremendous amount of computation to be performed, and one way of getting around that is to do this in the Fourier domain instead. Maybe that's also a future video topic. However, my processor didn't have a multiplier, so multiplying was not an easy thing to do. Instead, I just took the sum of this region and compared that to the sum of corresponding regions elsewhere in the image, under a naive assumption that if the absolute difference of those regions summed to somewhere near zero, that they were in some way similar. Of course, that's complete rubbish, but it actually turned out to be a good enough assumption in this case. It's very crude, it's very approximate, and it's liable to all sorts of statistical abnormalities that are going to interfere with its effectiveness. Instead of searching the whole frame, I make an assumption that the object that we're trying to track can't move very far between frames, i.e. it's not very fast. So the region I need to search, I constrain to the locality of the object's position in the previous frame. And so now once I take the sum of the object I'm tracking, I can compare it to the sum of this region, the sum of this region, the sum of this region, and so forth, until I've covered my entire red outline here. Yes, there's still a lot of checks to perform, but they're all summations based upon integral images. So the actual computation required is nothing more than addition, and not very many additions at that. And that's exactly what the code here does. If I'm not holding down the space key, I'm defining my region to track by the location of the mouse. Therefore, I can select a region in the camera frame, and hopefully when I hold down space for successive frames, it's going to follow that region around. I know the sum of the area I want to track, and so I extract from the camera frame the equivalent area in the location I want to test for. And I do that for all the pixels surrounding my current tracking location. And this becomes trivial because I'm just using the integral image of the camera and working out the absolute of the difference between my tracking summation and that regional summation. I look for the lowest difference, because the lowest difference would give an indication that there is something at least vaguely similar about these regions. Although I repeat again, statistically this method is terrible and I don't advise that you do it this way. Finally, I'm just going to draw a reticule over the currently tracked location. And here's the trick. Once we start tracking a region of the screen, it's important to then reread that region from the screen from the new tracked location. This allows objects to have very slight variance between frames. For example, the object could rotate slightly, the lighting could change ever so slightly. Providing the change isn't too significant, the updated image is more likely to be found in the next frame, rather than the original image that we started with, which could have changed quite a lot during its transition across the frame. So let's take a look. Hello, there's me and uh, this is my webcam obviously and this is an object I'm going to track. Now there's a reticule here over my cursor and if I press the spacebar at the right time and move the object around slowly and very crudely it kind of tracks the object. It's not very accurate, it can get lost easily and as I mentioned before this is actually a really bad way of doing this. It's just not good. Uh, we can retrain the object as well. So there we go. But on my limited hardware, this was totally sufficient for what we needed it to do. The uh, object was being tracked by a pan and tilt camera system. So we just needed to keep the object in the center of the screen. So yes, there you have it. Uh, we're doing a full image convolution here using nothing but integral images.
It's been a quick and a fast one, but I wanted to get something out because I've not had a video for a couple of weeks now because of the jam. So if you've enjoyed this one, a thumbs up, please. Have a think about subscribing. There's a big reticule on my face. And uh, I'll see you next time. Though hang around for a little demonstration of what I submitted to the jam this week. My submission was a game called Meaningless Cog. And the premise is very simple. It's a massively multiplayer online platform game, though I'm doubting there's actually going to be any players on here today. So when you start the game, you connect to the server. And you control your character. Your avatar is generated for you. You can move left and right, you can jump, and you can also pulse. And pulsing affects the other players nearby. The objective of the game is quite simple. As quickly as you can, you've got to get from the starting location, which is defined by following the arrow here, to the target location. And there's wall jumping and ledge grabbing. Oof, missed. Try again. There we go. And when you get to the target location, your time is recorded and the number of parcels you have delivered increases by one. I've currently got a cog floating around me. That's because I'm employee of the month. I have currently de delivered the most parcels out of all of the people playing at the moment. Sadly, it's just me playing at the moment. But if there were other people online, you would also see them jumping around racing for the same aim. I recommend that you give this a go. Go and download it from the Itch website. I'll put a link below. It's completely free, doesn't require you to create an account or anything, and it's just a bit of fun. It also works with gamepads. Uh, just coincidentally, I can't win uh, the jam, simply because I hosted it and I was aware of the theme beforehand. But whilst you're there checking out this one, certainly do check out some of the others too. Until next time, see you later.